this morning. Uh, before we get to the ones that are on the screen that you'll see, I do want to mention if you have, uh, if you signed up for a JFK craft and goodie bag, they are back in the foyer underneath the missionary board, so you can grab those 
Uh, before you leave, if you if you signed up for one of those JFK uh, goodie bags, uh, the next announcement there, of course, is our membership class. It keeps getting pushed back uh, just because of different circumstances. So, Lord willing, we will have that uh, class next week after the 10 a.m. service. Uh, and of course, if if for whatever reason you weren't able to sign up before because you weren't going to be here, be there the Sunday that it was supposed to be. Maybe that Sunday works better. That sign-up sheet is still out there, so today would be the deadline to sign up if you're interested in learning more about pursuing uh, membership. The next announcement on the screen there is about the uh, Amazing Race. The youth group, the 116 youth group, uh, as they have been named, will be competing in a kind of competition where they go around town, uh, follow clues, compete in different things to get more clues. And then, of course, the first person back to the church, first team back, uh, wins. So that'll be a lot of fun next week. And that'll start at 4 o'clock here at the church, and it will end at 7 o'clock here at the church. So the teams will, I know, have a good time doing that. Also, Children's Church, as we've mentioned, our desire is to get that going on November the 1st. So that Sunday during the 10 a.m. service only, that is ages 3 through 6th grade. If you do have children that are 3 and below, we will have nursery open as well for that uh, 10 a.m. service. So only uh, children's church and nursery for the 10 a.m. service. That will be uh, two weeks, November 1st. Uh, also, on November 1st, we will be uh, starting our Sunday night Bible study again. So that will be 6 o'clock uh, in the evening for our, our Sunday evening Bible study starting November 1st. Of course, you'll see in the bulletin there if you're interested in singing in the choir, let Heather know. And the last, uh, uh, last announcement there that, that you've probably seen as well, the, the prayer chain. Uh, we have not had bulletins the last couple weeks, so maybe you've been eager to sign up and haven't had that chance because you haven't had the connection card there to fill out. So if you do uh, not receive those requests and would like to be added, fill out your, put your email address on the connection card, put that you'd like to receive prayer e emails, put that in the offering plate, uh, and then I will get that and add you to uh, that group so you can send and receive prayer requests for the prayer chain. So that is all the announcements I have. We'll turn our attention now to Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 4 for our call to worship. Hebrews chapter 1, beginning there in verse 1. The author writes, Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to the two angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. Let's pray. Father, I pray today that our desire would be truly to worship you, to uh, take our focus off of ourselves, off of uh, the circumstances of life, uh, off of lesser things, and to put them upon you, not only in our time together in this service this morning, but Father, throughout our lives, may we focus on you. And Father, we pray that we would glorify you today as we seek to bring you worship and praise, uh, of course, the worship that is due your name. Lord, help us to uh, exalt in the gospel today, to uh, glory in the fact that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So, Father, help us today to truly set our hearts upon you, stir our hearts to uh, desire you more, to uh, just glory in uh, your presence in our lives. And we'll give you all the honor and glory, uh, both today and throughout our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to invite you to stand again as we continue to worship the Lord through singing. <laughs>
Turn to Colossians chapter 1 this morning. Of course, Pastor Justin has been walking us through the book of Ephesians, and uh, a lot of times, if I know ahead of time that he's going to be gone on Sunday, uh, I will just kind of pick up where he left off in the text and just kind of carry us along. Of course, we've been talking about uh, unity in the church, and so uh, because it's kind of been a multi part uh, message, I think we were in part four last week. Uh, and I didn't want to take the last part of that series away, uh, which should be next week, uh, talking about unity. I thought, well, we'll look at the same idea of church unity, and we'll try to find a different text uh, and, and, and consider the same topic. And so uh, I want us to look today at Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 to 23, and I want us to consider the focus of unity. We've talked so far about um, different aspects of call to unity, the uh, unity through character, through doctrine, through diverse gifts. Uh, and of course, last week, Pastor Justin mentioned that in our desire for unity, it's important that we don't just focus on unity. We focus primarily on Jesus. And as we focus on Jesus, unity will ultimately come. And so uh, that's what I want us to think about today is the focus of our unity, which is, of course, Jesus. So let's look at Colossians chapter 1. Verses 15 to 23. And since you just since you were just seated, I'll have you, uh, you can remain seated this morning as we read Colossians 1, beginning there in verse 15. The Apostle Paul writing says, He, of course speaking of Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or, or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body of the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And you, who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he is now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death, in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. Let's go to the Lord and ask him to help us as we look to his word today. Father, I pray that you would open your word to us, that we would see the glory and the majesty of Jesus. That we would, even as we read your word and study your word, we would be struck with a sense of awe, a sense of worship. Father, help us as we do that to shift the focus from ourselves and onto you, onto Jesus, onto the Holy Spirit. So, Father, be glorified in our midst. Give us understanding, but, Father, apply it to our hearts and lives uh, that we may live it out to your glory. And we'll give you all the praise in Jesus' name. we think about unity, we can consider that probably the greatest hindrance to unity would be focusing on the wrong thing. If we're focused on the wrong thing, we will not experience unity as a church. And the primary wrong thing that I believe we focus on that leads to disunity, to discord in our church, 
is ourselves. When we focus on ourselves, we are, we are, of course, born with a natural bent to focus on ourselves. We're born sinners. We're born uh, not desiring the things of God. And so because of that, we naturally are going to focus on ourselves. But it doesn't help that the culture we live in uh, teaches us and tells us that it's all about us. We, we turn on the TV and you'll see commercials. And what are the commercials geared toward? They're focused on the consumer and how this product will make your life better. How this is all about you. Uh, you know, think about, about what is it, Burger King? Have it your way, right? That's kind of the mentality of our culture. It's all about us. It's all about the consumer. But many times this focus of ourselves can carry over into our church as well. We can come to our church gathering and we can have the mindset that it's all about me, right? That it's all about what I, uh, what my preferences are, what makes me happy, what meets my needs. Now, of course, a church is, of course, supposed to focus on meeting the needs, the spiritual needs of people and even physical needs. But many times we can put that at the highest place in our focus and make that the ultimate goal. We can have what I would call a cruise ship mentality. I've never had the opportunity to go on a cruise. Many of you I know have. Uh, but the cruise ship mentality, I would say, is you're looking at a church and, and you're evaluating it like it's a cruise ship, right? What, are the, what, what kind of entertainment is going to be provided? Am I going to like the food that's offered? Am I, is, the, is the wait staff going to care for my every need? You're totally focused on how that cruise ship will give you a good experience. And we can have that focus many times when it comes to our church body. But instead, we're to have what I would call a cruise, or a warship, a battleship mentality. Not a cruise ship mentality where it's all about us, but a battleship mentality. Where we're coming together and we have a common goal, a common purpose, a common mission. And so we are each working and serving in the way that we're gifted to accomplish that mission for the glory of God. So to accomplish that mission with unity, our focus has to be on something other than ourselves. Our focus has to be primarily upon Jesus, who he is, what he's done, and what he desires us to do. And if we each truly keep Jesus as that primary focus, we will ultimately experience the unity that God desires us to experience as a church body. So Jesus has the focus of our desire for unity. I want us to consider this morning five truths that we see here in Colossians chapter 1. Five truths about Jesus that will hopefully help us to shift our focus away from ourselves and onto Jesus and his glory. So the first one is this. Jesus is the creator of all things. We see this in verse 15 and 16. Look at this again. It says, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. Jesus is the creator of all things. The word there for image, and when it says he's the image of the invisible God, it is the word, uh, the, the English word, or the word where we get the English word, icon. It can refer to the image of a person, like on a coin or a statue. And when we think about mankind, we know, going back to Genesis, that we were created in the image of God, right? We have certain characteristics that God has. Think about the idea of the fact that we have intellect, emotion, and will, just like God. However, we are not in the perfect image of God. That image has been marred because of sin, because of selfishness and pride. But when we think about Jesus being the image of the invisible God, it's not just the same as we are, the lesser image. He is the exact imprint of who God is, as he is God. As we read in Hebrews 1, in our call to worship, it tells us that he, Jesus, is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. If you look at John chapter 1, you'll see very clearly that Jesus is God in the flesh. It says in John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. And then verse 14 tells us that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, 
And we have seen his glory. Glory is of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Then a few verses further, John 1.18 tells us, No one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. When we look to Jesus, we see God in the flesh. That's why when Philip asked Jesus to show him the Father, Jesus' response was, Have I been with you so long and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? So we see very clearly in these verses, Jesus is God in human form. And of course, being God, he is therefore the creator of everything. Now, if you look at verse 15, again, you'll see a word that maybe many people get hung up on. It says there, he's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Don't let that word firstborn uh, kind of trip you up because many times we see that word firstborn and we think first created. And, and many people have that false view that there was one God uh, existing in one person and then he created Jesus and then from Jesus he created everything else. That's not what the, this word in this verse is teaching. And throughout scripture we see that very clearly. The word firstborn here carries the idea of first in rank. Not necessarily first in a series of progressions, first in rank. We see the same word mentioned down in verse 18 when it says that Jesus is the firstborn from the dead. Now we know that Jesus was not the first in a series of progressions to rise from the dead. We know in his ministry earlier, Lazarus was resurrected from the dead. But what it's conveying is the same idea when it comes to creation, that he is the first in rank. Jesus is the first and most important person to rise from the dead. Why? Because through his resurrection... We can rise from the dead. If we put our faith in him, we will experience that resurrection. And so it's telling us that he's the firstborn. He's the preeminent one over all of creation because he is the one who created everything. That's what verse 16 says. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. Jesus has created everything. Being God from before the beginning of time, Jesus spoke everything into existence and created the vast universe and everything in it. John MacArthur explains it this way. The sheer size of the universe is staggering. The sun, for example, has a diameter of 864,000 miles, which is 100 times uh, larger than that of Earth's diameter. And it could hold 1.3 million planets the size of Earth inside of it. The star Betelgeuse, however, has a diameter of 100 million miles, which is larger than the Earth's orbit around the sun. It takes sunlight traveling at 186,000 miles per second, about eight and a half minutes to reach Earth. Yet the same light will take more than four years to reach the nearest star, Alpha Centauri which is 24 trillion miles from Earth. The galaxy to which our sun belongs, the Milky Way, contains hundreds of billions of stars. Astronomers estimate there are millions or even billions of galaxies. What they can see leads them to estimate the number of stars in the universe as 10 to the 25th power. That is roughly the number of all the grains of sand on all the world's beaches. A few uh, months ago, my wife and I bought a sandbox for our kids. And if you have a sandbox with kids, you know the sand does not stay in the sandbox. I think we bought four or five bags of sand, and there's literally none of it left in the box. But it didn't just disappear, right? It's scattered across our yard, across our driveway. Many times I've taken a blower out there and just seen countless pieces of sand everywhere can't imagine taking the time to count each of the individual grains of sand just in that sandbox, just in those bags of sand. And yet, think about the last time maybe you were at the beach. Imagine looking up one direction of the beach and then looking down the other and how much sand is just on that beach. What, it's, what MacArthur is saying here is that the number of stars, these enormous uh, cre pieces of creation, are... So numerous that if you added up all the sand on all the beaches in the world, 
we might have about as many stars as there are in the universe. Jesus spoke every one of these into existence. As we sung the song indescribable, he, he, he knows every one of those stars by name. When you go back to Genesis 1, it's kind of humorous at how it explains how the stars were created. It talks about God creating uh, the sun and the moon, and it says, oh, and the stars. Three words it gives to these amazing creations. And yet Jesus spoke these into existence. As large and as many as these are, Jesus also spoke into existence the very uh, smallest of particles. We would call it the quark. It's made of subatomic particles that have never been directly observed, but only theoretically predicted experimentally. Everything you can see, no matter how large, no matter how small, Jesus created it. The other element of the invisible creation that's referred to here in verse 16 is that of thrones, dominions, rulers, and authorities, which is a description of angelic ranks. Jesus created everything in the physical realm as well as everything in the spiritual realm. Of course, this means that Jesus created us as well. Psalm 100, verse 3 says, Know that the Lord, He is God. It is He who made us, and we are His. We are His people and the sheep of His pasture. So we not only see the reality that Everything was created by, by Jesus, but we see in verse 16 the reason for which everything was created. And that reason is for him and for his pleasure. Look at verse 16 again. It says, For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. As our creator, we are his possession. We were created for his pleasure, not our own. <clears throat> Warren Wiersbe says it this way. For centuries, Greek philosophers had taught that everything needed a primary cause, an instrumental cause, and a final cause. The primary cause is the plan. <coughs> Excuse me. The instrumental cause is the power. And the final cause is the purpose. When it comes to creation, Jesus is the primary cause because he planned it. He's the instrument, instrumental cause because he produced it. And he's the final cause because he did it for his own pleasure. So as people, as human beings, many times we tend to think that our life is about us. It's about what makes us happy. It's about doing what we want. But when we understand that we did not create ourselves, that we were created by God for a purpose, that purpose namely to glorify Him, to live for His pleasure and not our own, we can't help but hopefully shift our focus away from ourselves and onto Jesus, our Creator. R.C. Sproul said this, If God is the creator of the entire universe, then it must follow that He is Lord of the whole universe. No part of the world is outside of his lordship. That means that no part of my life must be outside of his lordship. We see that Jesus is the creator of all things. Secondly, we see in verse 17, the first part there, that Jesus is the precursor of all things. Look at verse 17, just the first, uh, first line there. It says, and he is before all things. He's before all things. Micah 5.2, in predicting the future coming Messiah, tells us that his coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. Look at John 1, which we read a few verses from, and even 1 John 1, tell us that Jesus existed in the beginning before the creation of the world. Jesus has existed from eternity past. In John 8.58, 8, 8, Jesus says, Before Abraham was, I am claim of deity, claiming that before Abraham ever came onto the scene, Jesus was already there existing. We know that's what he intended because the reaction of the Pharisees was to want to stone him in that moment because he was clearly claiming deity. In Revelation 22, 13, Jesus says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning 
and the end. We see that here that Jesus is eternal. Meaning, of course, that he is God. Only God can exist from eternity past to eternity future. So Jesus is the precursor of all things. He existed well before everything else. And, of course, including us. And when we think about that, we have to consider that our life is short in comparison to Jesus. And, of course, we think that we know uh, what's best for us. We think we know what life's all about, and yet Jesus has been on the scene long before we were ever even thought. And so it's him we should be looking to for wisdom and purpose in life. We see in the second part of verse 17 that Jesus is the sustainer of all things. It says there he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Lambert Dolphin, a physicist, says this, the nucleus of the atom contains positively charged and neutral particles, to use a simplistic model. Mutual electrostatic repulsion between the light positive protons would drive the nucleus apart if it were not for the strong force which binds the nucleus together. There is thus an active force imposed on the universe which actively holds the very atoms of the material world together moment by moment, day by day, Century by century. <coughs> Similarly, accelerated electrons circling the nucleus should quickly radiate all their energy away and fall into the nucleus unless there exists an invisible energy source to counteract this. Another physicist, Carl Darrow, says this. You grasp what this implies? It implies that all the massive nuclei have no right to be alive at all. Indeed, they should never have been created. And if created, they should have blown up instantly. Yet here they all are. Some inflexible inhibition is holding them relentlessly together. The nature of the inhibition is also a secret, one thus far served by nature for herself. For us as believers, it's no secret what holds all the particles, all the atoms of the universe together. This invisible force we know biblically is Jesus. As we read in Hebrews 1, Verse 3, the second part, tells us that Jesus upholds the universe by the word of his power. The same words that were used to create, the same spoken word uh, is used to uphold the universe, to hold everything together. Just as he spoke the world into existence without lifting a finger, so Jesus upholds the universe and sustains it by the power of his word. If at any moment Jesus were to cease from this activity... From the sustaining work, every atom in all the universe would explode like a nuclear bomb. So we see Jesus is the sustainer of all things. In comparison to the one who holds all things together, just by the power of his voice, we are weak and helpless. If we seek to live our life in self-sufficiency, focused on ourselves, putting ourselves in that place of Lord in our life, we are rejecting the one who holds our very being together, the one who could at any moment cease from that work and, of course, would lead to our destruction. Jesus is the very one holding together the atoms that make up the elements of oxygen and nitrogen in the air that we breathe in order to sustain our lives. And so as we think of that, the, the one who sustains our life is, of course, worthy of our life. We see next in verses 18 and 19 that Jesus is the superior of all things. <clears throat> all these ideas are building to these verses here in verse 18 and 19. It tells us that Jesus is the head of the body, the church. He's the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. Jesus is the superior of all things. First of all, it tells us that he's the head of the church. Not in the sense of a CEO of an organization being the head. It's the picture of a body, physical body. We've talked a lot about this, about the spiritual gifts last week. We'll, I believe, talk about it next week as we consider that again. The picture is Jesus is the head of the body, right? He's the one for, from whom the, the rest of the body functions. All those who have trusted Christ are part of that body of believers with Jesus as the head. 
tells us he's the beginning of the church. He's, a, he's the founder of the church in the sense of those who proclaim their faith in him, those who are set apart, who are called out to serve him. He's the firstborn from the dead, as we mentioned before, meaning he's the highest in rank of those who have rose from the dead because his resurrection power provides victory over sin and death and gives us resurrection, those of us who trust him by faith. And so all these truths of Jesus as creator, as precursor, as sustainer, show us that he is preeminent. He is preeminent. In other words, Jesus rightly deserves to be first place in our life, in every area of our life. Why? Because it says that he's the fullness of God in bodily form. He existed before everything, he created everything, he sustains everything, and therefore he alone is worthy of that place of preeminence in our life and therefore in our church body. 1 Corinthians 10, 31-33 says, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Our life is meant to be lived to the glory of God in worship of Him. Jeff Durbin says that worship is glory and sacrifice. It's what you glory in. It's what you give weight to. It's what you sacrifice to. It's what you give preeminence to. And Jesus alone is worthy of that worship and that place of Preeminence. <clears throat> and yet, unfortunately, many times, even us as believers can put something else in that position of preeminence. It may be, uh, we, we of course put our own desires, our pleasures, passions, ambitions, our happiness, our well-being as the most important thing. We live as though we are worthy of that place of preeminence. We may put a relationship with another person in that place of preeminence. Maybe it's our job, our career. Maybe it's a, a hobby or sport that we enjoy playing. It could be many, many things that we put in place of God. And those things aren't bad. But when we put them in the place of preeminence above Christ, they, are, they fall short of Jesus, who alone is worthy. And so nothing, nothing comes close to surpassing the worth of being the supreme focus of our lives compared to Jesus. And therefore, as a church, he should be the primary focus of, of our purpose as a church body as well. And so as our creator and sustainer, he deserves preeminence. The next and final truth that we see here in the text about Jesus is that Jesus is the reconciler of all things. Verses 20 to 23. And before we look to the text, Consider that none of us truly puts Jesus in that place of preeminence like we should. We put other things in that place, and Jesus many times is bumped to second or third or fourth or maybe not even ranked at all in our life. We're prone, of course, as we mentioned, to selfishness because of sin. That sin separates us from God. It makes us, as we see in these verses, uh, opposed to God. We are alienated. We are hostile in mind, it says in verse 21. We are set apart or set. Uh, we, we do not desire him. Uh, we, we turn away from the Lord. And so as his enemies, we do not pursue him. We do not worship him as we should. He deserves that place of preeminence. And because we do not give it to him, we rightly deserve death because of our sin. Many times we're tempted to think that we're not really that bad of a person, right? I don't do this or that. I, you know, I'm not drinking or doing drugs or you know, doing all these, these other things. But many times we think that sin is just the bad things that we do in life. When in reality, sin is not giving Christ that place of preeminence. I love the way John Piper put it. And, and you've probably, maybe many of you have heard this quote. But he asked this question, what is sin? What is sin? He answers it this way. It is the glory of God not honored. The holiness of God not reverenced. The greatness of God not admired. The power of God not praised. The truth of God not sought. The wisdom of God not esteemed. 
The beauty of God, not treasure. The goodness of God, not savor. The faithfulness of God, not trusted. The commandments of God, not obeyed. The justice of God, not respected. The wrath of God, not feared. The grace of God, not cherished. The presence of God, not prized. The person of God, not loved. That is sin. Sin is not just those wrong things that we do. We can compare ourselves to others and think we're not as bad as they are. Sin is ultimately not giving God the glory that he deserves. Not living and putting him in the place of preeminence. But the beauty of the, the reality that Jesus is the reconciler of all things is that none of us do that. None of us in our own strength can truly put him in that place of preeminence. And yet what it says here in verse 20 is that through him, through Jesus, to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. It says, And you who were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he is now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. This is the beauty of the gospel. God deserves that place of preeminence. Christ deserves that, and yet all of us have fallen short. And yet in his mercy and love, though we deserve to be crushed, though we deserve his wrath, because we forsake our creator and sustainer, God in his mercy sent Jesus, God in the flesh, to bear the weight of that sin upon himself, to take our sin, to pay the penalty for it, and then of course to rise from the dead, that we can be reconciled, that we can be restored to him, that we can be given life in him, we can be given his Holy Spirit that now gives us, as believers, the ability to truly put him in that place of preeminence, to worship him and to serve him, to make him the purpose of our life, to focus not just on ourselves, but to focus and to worship him. And so we all, I'm sure, would acknowledge that we're prone to selfishness. Even as believers, we can struggle to put Christ in that place of preeminence. But my challenge today, if you're here and you have not put your faith in Christ, realize that you fall short. The Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All of us have fallen short of that standard of worshiping God, of serving Him, of making Him the very purpose of our life. And if we try to do that in our own strength, we will just continually fall short. And yet, as we've seen, the beauty of the gospel is that Christ came, God in the flesh, to reconcile us to God by dying, taking the punishment upon himself, and rising again from the dead. And it's when we realize that we are unworthy to be made right with God, but that Jesus was fully worthy in our place. And as we turn from sin and put our faith in Christ, that we can have a restored, a reconciled relationship with God. It's then that we can have the ability to live uh, for the glory of God, to fulfill the purpose for which we were created. And so for us, those of us who have done that, those of us who put our faith in Christ, is Jesus right now in this moment preeminent in your life? Is he first place? Or is there something else? Is there career? Is there a relationship? Is there a, you know, whatever else, maybe a hobby? Ultimately, those things are just us stepping in that place of preeminence, focusing on ourselves instead of on Christ and on others. But the challenge I want us to today is, of course, to experience the unity that God desires for us to have in the church. We have to keep our focus on Him. If we're focused on ourselves, and if we have, as I mentioned, that cruise ship mentality, then when things don't go our way, we're going to be prone to grumble and complain. And it's going to lead to discord and disunity in our church body. But if we're focused all together on Jesus, on the mission that he's called us to, of course, the gospel that saved us and the mission that he's given us to proclaim that gospel message for his glory to the world, and we will experience unity. So is Christ preeminent in your life today? May God show us all the things that we pursue 
over him that fall short of truly bringing joy and satisfaction in our life. May we see the glory of God as the highest priority of our lives as we seek to know him more and to make him known to the world around us. May we today focus on Jesus as individuals and our personal walk with Christ. May he be at the forefront of our focus, but may he also collectively as a church body be our focus. May we be united in the mission that he has given us to make his glory known to the world for his glory and for the furtherance of the gospel. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, I, I come to you and I admit that well, there are so many times in my life that I lose focus of what's to be the most important thing, which is ultimately you. And so, Lord, I pray that you would help me and help each of us to, through your grace, examine our lives. Or as your word says, search me and know me. Or try our thoughts. See if there be some wicked way in us and then lead us into the way everlasting. For if there's things that we're putting in higher priority over you, ultimately help us to see that it's us, it's ourselves, our selfish pride that is putting us in the position that only you rightfully deserve. So Father, help us to confess that today if need be, and help us to keep you at the forefront of our focus. Help us to live our life, not just for the temporary pleasures that we can get that do not bring lasting joy and satisfaction. Father, help us to live for the purpose for which we were created, to make you known, to know you more, and to give you glory. And we ask this today in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to stand as we close out our service singing, We Fall Down.
Uh, as he's our creator, sustainer, as he's reconciled us uh, through his death, may we live for him as we go out. May we make him known uh, to others. So thanks for being here today. We'll pray, and we hope to see you guys uh, back either Wednesday for our growth group that meets here uh, at the church, maybe your various growth groups that meet uh, in the community. We hope to see you back either then or Sunday. And don't forget, if you want to sign up for membership class or if you've got a JFK bag back there, be sure to grab that before you leave as well. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, again, we just pray that you would help us to, to live for your glory. As we leave here now, may we um, not just lay aside your word, but maybe meditate on it. And we do for your Holy Spirit. Uh, open our eyes to the ways that we uh, do not put you in that place of preeminence. And may you, by your grace, uh, give us the power and the ability to put you in that place of preeminence. To live for you, to live for your pleasure, for your glory alone, and to make you known to others. And Lord, as we do so, help us not to uh, take any of the glory for ourselves, but truly to give it all to you, as you alone are worthy. We'll give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You can be dismissed.